Hello everyone, Pete from Automotive Seminars here. This case study is a sample of one of the topics in our upcoming Asian Vehicle Diagnostics class. The live class is on June 27 and 29 at 7 p.m. Central and costs $140 for the entire shop. Also included is the video copy that you can stream with unlimited access after the live event has concluded. Now here is John Thornton. Hello, I'm John Thornton. And on behalf of Automotive Seminars, I'd like to welcome you to this training case study. The vehicle that we will be discussing is a 2014 Infiniti Q50. And this Q50 has the 3.7 liter VQ37 VHR engine. So this is the performance oriented version of a 3.7. I'll talk more about the VHR component in just a moment. So the vehicle, as you can see, has just under 100,000 miles. And the concern is that the engine cranks strongly, but does not start. There's no hint of combustion. So it's missing something pretty significant. I've always believed that it's a good idea that when we're preparing to diagnose an engine concern, especially one that we may not be that familiar with, that we understand the technology that's supported by this engine. So this engine does have variable cam timing on the intake side, but not on the exhaust. Additionally, this engine has variable valve event and lift or as Nissan Infiniti calls it, VVEL, and this is found on the intake side. So this is a, a technology that very quickly can change lift and duration. It is uh, somewhat similar to the BMW Valvetronic system. Again, similar, uh, not exactly the same. Also, the engine has two mass airflow sensors, of course, one for each bank, uh, port fuel, and a fairly high compression ratio. So once again, our issue is that this engine cranks, but it does not start. The shop that I'm assisting with this concern has told me that when they connect the spark tester, there's spark briefly, a couple, uh, three sparks, and then it, it stops. Also, there are no codes when pulled from the enhanced side uh, using the scan tool. So I'm going to connect up using an Autel here, and always a good idea to verify the VIN you know, sometimes computers get swapped or changed, but I do verify that the VIN is correct for this vehicle. And I start with a module scan. Now, while sometimes these other modules may have nothing to do with a no start, you know, sometimes you can have issues maybe with a mobilizer, uh, CAN bus communication. So it's never a bad idea to run a scan to see what's going on with the vehicle overall. So you can see here on this first screen, I have uh, my critical modules respond and they do not have any codes and finishing the scan, I have all the modules and there are no codes, just as the shop told me. So I'm gonna prepare to diagnose this uh, no start. So I'm kind of organizing some data pids and I'm thinking about what's important. And you can see up there, I have engine speed, tack, I have the start signal, I have the intake cam uh, position. So on Nissan Infinities, the default position uh, is zero degrees. So, and normally on a Nissan product, if the cam timing is off, and it's being measured, again, the intakes are, the exhausts are not, you know, we'll see that with scan data. Now, something I wanna add here is this engine does have VVEL. As a matter of fact, the 3.7 liter VHR was the first Nissan Infiniti engine to receive VVEL. So we need to kind of keep an eye on this. So you'll notice right now that we have a, we have four data pits. Uh, there's two pits for each bank. Uh, one of the PIDs is voltage. So you can see the 0.6 volts. So there is a position sensor that provides this voltage and then it's converted into degrees. So what I'd like to do now is kind of pause, working our way through the case study and discuss briefly uh, VVEL or variable valve event and lift. And my goal here is to talk about it enough such that we're able to understand the data 
that we see provided by the scan tool without going into super detail. Uh, to do this topic correctly, we would need a heck of a lot more time, but I think I can provide the highlights in a relatively short period of time. So we have two shafts that are used to open and close the intake valves on a VVEL system. Uh, the first shaft is the intake shaft. Now, normally, we would call this a cam shaft, but I'm not going to use the term cam shaft because that really does not describe what the shaft is doing. So I'm not going to use the term intake shaft. And the intake shaft is driven by the primary timing chain via the crank sprocket and the phaser sprocket. And the main job of the intake shaft is to drive a rocker arm up and down. So we all know how rocker arms work. So if the rocker arm goes up, theoretically, the valve goes down and, and vice versa. So the job of the intake shaft is to drive the rocker arm. And we'll see how that's done here in a moment. Additionally, of course, uh, the intake shaft position is monitored by a cam sensor and that data is available uh, to us. There's also a second shaft. This shaft is called the control shaft. And a control shaft does not spin like the intake shaft. The control shaft can rotate approximately 90 degrees. They rarely get that far, but theoretically it could hit about 90 degrees and it's controlled by a large DC motor. Again, not unlike the early Valvetronic BMW systems. The job of the control shaft is to change the rocker arm pivot point. So the intake shaft is going to drive the rocker arm. The control shaft is going to change the pivot of the rocker arm. And by changing the pivot, we will be able to vary lift and duration. Now, as it turns out, the control shaft is also monitored by a position sensor. And the position sensor outputs a raw voltage, you know, approximately 600 millivolts key on engine off. And then that voltage is converted into degrees. And normally when these engines idle with no problems, you know, we might have six, seven, eight degrees at idle. Are running down the road as we require more air mass, for the engine, that number will move to 30, 40, 50, 60 degrees. So that's where that data is coming from. So let's take a closer look, but again, kind of a you know an overview of VVEL. So I'm going to show you a few illustrations, and each illustration I'm going to focus on a specific part of the system. And I know that when you first look at a picture like this, there's certainly a lot going on, but we're going to break it up into uh, hopefully manageable pieces. So the first piece is the intake shaft. So I know I, I'm repeating myself here a little bit, but the intake shaft is driven by the crank via the primary chain and the uh, phaser sprocket. So in this illustration to your lower right here, it says drive shaft. Now that is the intake shaft. And this shaft does not have lobes that are machined or cast or pressed onto it. The job of this shaft as it rotates is to move this eccentric. So right here, if you look where my green highlight is, there is an eccentric and its center line is offset to the center line of the intake shaft, or again, called here, the drive shaft. So this is the drive shaft, obviously, you know, almost the length of the head. And as this rotates, this eccentric will move kind of in, in an elliptical pattern and it will cause a drive. So if you look right here, uh, Nissan calls this drive link A, but this is going to move this rocker arm up and down. So we're gonna take rotary motion, the motion of the intake shaft, because of the eccentric, we will create it into a vertical motion. Now the rocker arm pivots on the control shaft, which we'll discuss here in just a moment. So this is the control shaft here, and this is the rocker arm, kind of that dull green color. So as the intake shaft turns, because of the eccentric mounting, it will drive the rocker arm up and down. On the other side of the rocker arm is what's called drive link B. 
and drive link B, which is shown in black here, will also move up and down. So as this moves up, that moves down. And it's a little hard to see in this picture, but drive link B, the black piece here, is actually connected to a dual cam lobe. So those are the cam lobes there. You see it right here on top of the lifter bucket and right there. Now, what makes this picture tricky visually is that the cam lobes are mounted on around the intake shaft but they're not connected to the intake shaft. So this is an important piece of information. So as that shaft is rotating, the shaft is actually rotating within these cam lobes. So these cam lobes do not spin as normal lobes spin. So they will pivot up and down as the rocker moves. We'll, we'll see a little bit a better view of that here shortly. So, so the primary takeaway from this screen is that the intake shaft, which is driven by the crankshaft via the chain and the phaser sprocket, primary job is to drive the rocker arm through an eccentric. Then we have the control shaft. So the control shaft is just above the intake shaft. So here's the control shaft right here. And again, this picture is scaled to make it fit. But let's start at the back and we'll work our way towards the front. So we have a fairly large DC motor, one for each bank. And the job at a DC motor is to turn a ball screw shaft. So this ball screw shaft is captured. So the, the shaft does not have the ability to move longitudinally. It can only turn. So as you can probably guess what's going to happen here, that nut is mounted to the shaft. Since the shaft is captured, as the shaft is rotating, the nut is what will move horizontally as we look at this picture. So that nut can move you know, left to right, right here. And through linkage, the nut is going to move this control shaft. So right here, kind of in gray, is a position sensor. So that position sensor monitors the position of the control shaft, and that provides those two data pits that we see, the raw voltage and then the converted degree. Uh, there's actually a physical stop, which again, limits the movement of the control shaft to about 90 degrees. Again, we're not gonna see that typically, but it's about 90 degrees. So. Let's see what the job of the control shaft is. So we know that the intake shaft via its eccentric drives the rocker arm. Well, what the control shaft does, it changes the pivot of the rocker arm. So if you take a close look here at this control shaft, so the rocker arm is mounted on it. You know, it's almost like an older technology rocker arm shaft. However, there's a big difference. And the difference is there's an eccentric here as well. So you'll, if you come over here to the left, so this kind of lightly colored orange right here, this represents the rocker arm in three different positions. I know it's a tough picture to look at, but it shows it in three different positions. And the center part right here where the crosshairs are, that is the control shaft. So that piece right here, this is the control shaft. And this is what can move, you know, between, you know, typically, two, three degrees, and let's say 60, 70 degrees, that would be a normal range. But as it rotates, it moves this eccentric. So you get a better view of the eccentric right here. So the rocker arm pivots around the eccentric. So if we move the eccentric by moving the control shaft, we will change the amount of motion that's delivered to this drive link B. So again, drive link B is this black component right here that is controlling the movement of the cam. So right now we see the term output cams. So it's kind of a dual cam element, obviously two intake valves per cylinder, and it's on top of the buckets. So as you could tell, if the rocker arm goes up, the drive link B goes down and it forces the valves open, of course. How far, how long, is a function of the position of the control shaft and the eccentric. So when we see the control shaft at 30, 40, 50, 60 degrees, we are requesting greater air mass, uh, greater duration, greater lift. When we see numbers like six, seven, eight, nine degrees, less duration, less lift.
And if we kind of group it together, and I know there's a lot here, it's almost you know overpowering in terms of what we're looking at here. And it's kind of tricky because I'm doing this you know, in a relatively quick fashion, but the main thing to keep in mind, we have two shafts that work together to control lift and duration. The intake shaft, which was formerly called an intake camshaft, is driven by the crank primary chain phaser sprocket. Its primary job as it rotates, as it spins, is to drive the rocker arm, to move the rocker arm up and down. We also have the control shaft. The control shaft does not spin, but it has the ability to rotate up to 90 degrees. And the position of the control shaft, which is finally controlled by the DC motor and feedback from the position sensor, determines the pivot for that rocker arm. So by varying the pivot, so here would be the center line right there. So there's the eccentric. So by varying the pivot, we will vary how far down drive link B, the black piece here, which is connected to the cam lobes right here, how far down they go. So as you look at the picture in the lower left, and you have to remember there's shafts going through this. So you can see where the rocker arm is kind of highlighted in red. And right there, that is the control shaft. So the rocker arm pivots on the control shaft and how it pivots is a function of control shaft position and eccentric. This is the intake lobe shown in green. Now remember the intake lobe is supported by the intake shaft, but it's not attached to the intake shaft in that it does not move as the intake shaft move. So the intake shaft rotates within it. So think of the intake shaft as really just a, a support, a pivot for the lobe. And the link in B connects the rocker arm to the lobe. So all this lobe does, it moves up and down. And as it moves up and down, it slides across the face of the brighter orange lifter bucket. And depending on its position, determines the duration and lift of the intake valves. So I would kind of wrap this up by saying, you know, when we look at Nissan Infiniti VVEL, we have two shafts that we need to be concerned with. The intake shaft, the control shaft. The intake shaft is monitored by the cam sensor as intake camshafts have been in the past. And the control shaft is, mounted, is monitored by the control shaft position sensor. And this system has the ability to very quickly vary lift and duration from low lift, low duration to much higher lift, higher duration by changing the pivot of the rocker arm. So I know that was a lot, kind of a detour in our case study, but I felt it's important, you know, again, when we're dealing with drivability concerns, the better the understanding of the data PIDs, you know, the easier, not that our job is easier, but the easier it is to get a handle on what's going on with the vehicle. So before I get actually back to the vehicle, let me show you some known good data from a 2009 FX50 with a five liter. So while this is a five liter and the vehicle that we are discussing is a 3.7, the uh, VVEL system works in a very similar fashion. So preparing to start the vehicle, one of the differences between the five liter and the 3.7 is the five liter has variable cam timing on the exhaust as well as the intake. So that's why you see some exhaust pids up there, but I'm only concerned with the intake. So right now, key on, engine off, our intake cams are at zero degrees, the normal default position. And if you recall, our control shaft for each bank is about two to three degrees, just like our 3.7. So that would be normal. So the vehicle starts and runs. I'm gonna let the RPM stabilize. You know, so of course there's always some fast idle flare, but the RPM comes down and now it's stabilized. So the first thing you'll notice is that we have very aggressive cam phasing on the intake at idle. So it's about 40 degrees of phase. Now this is a little bit unusual, but I want to explain why that is. And this is something, again, if you were, or if you have worked on a BMW Valvetronic, you see a similar relationship. 
So right now, when we look at the VVEL, the degree pids, we're about seven degrees. So that would suggest the control shaft position is low lift, low duration. So if you think about low lift, low duration, when you have narrow duration because of the low lift, that means the intake valve opens much later than normal and closes much earlier than normal. Let's focus on the opening. So of course, when you have an intake stroke, we want air to get into the cylinder. Well, if you were in a low lift position with low duration, that intake valve opens very late. So what manufacturers do, and BMW does this as well, is that to compensate for that, they will advance the intake cam significantly so that we still have low duration, low lift, but we open that valve earlier in the intake stroke so we can get air mass into the cylinder. So it is important to keep in mind that even though variable cam timing and variable valve lift are two separate systems in terms of hardware, they work very closely together. So if one is a problem, the other is affected. So let's increase the RPM. So now we're about uh, 2,600 RPM in park, light load. And you'll notice that we've even gone up to about 50 degrees of advance. And our VVEL went to about 11 degrees. So we still have very modest lift and duration. Now I'm gonna do a brake torque in reverse. So about 1700 RPM, you see the exhaust cams are phasing a little bit. And now if you look at the VVEL control shaft position, we're 30 degrees. So this is a situation where I'm loading the engine, which of course demands an increase in air mass. So you'll notice that the phasing decreased a little bit, but our duration and our lift increased. So again, they work very closely uh, to each other. And finally, just on a startup. So this graph, uh, it's a little, uh, little challenging to uh, see what's going on here initially, but what we're looking at are the four VVEL data pids during the start startup. So the, the top two are bank one voltage and bank two voltage. So that's the voltage from the position sensor on the back of the control shaft. And then the bottom two are the degree pids. So you'll notice there's different color boxes. They have to do with the vertical cursors. So where you see the gold cursor, this was key on engine off. That was about 2.7, two and a half degrees. Pretty typical. Then the engine cranks and starts. And right there, I put the green cursor. So our, our maximum lift duration via the control shaft was about 50 degrees, which makes perfect sense because of course, when you start an engine, we need air mass. So we need air to enter into the engine. So there's also going to be, you know, I'm not showing you any of the, the phase, but we definitely have, you know, increased lift, increased duration. So Having said that, I, I hope you have a, a, a reasonably good understanding of VVL and how we interpret those data pits. So now we go back to our vehicle. This is kind of where I left off. So this was key on engine off. So I'm looking at my two VVEL uh, degree pits. They're both about three degrees, which seems to be pretty normal. And now we're going to crank the engine over. And once again, the engine does not start, but I do crank it. I will show you a graphing in a moment, but for right now, the digital is a little bit easier for discussion. You can see the start signal says on, so I am cranking. There is some cranking speed at 100 RPM there. And I think you've I've, I think you've seen the problem. I think you know exactly what's going on here. So we see that the actual intake cam positions, shaft positions are incorrect relative to each other. So bank two, uh, the driver's side is a negative 3.5 degrees. So on Nissan, negative would mean retarded. So 3.5 would suggest there's wear and tear. So this is a 100,000 mile engine. There's probably a little bit of chain stretch. There's probably some gear wear as well. So the fact that I see at this moment in time, three and a half degrees negative is reasonable. That would not be a cause for concern. Bank one, uh, passenger side at a negative 17, well, that's a different story. That's excessive. And certainly we have a cam position error on bank one. I'm going to guess that we're probably out about a tooth on a sprocket. I don't like to guess, 
So we'll prove that in just a, a moment or two. Look at the VVELs. I would have expected during cranking to have a much greater number, not unlike what we saw on the five liter, maybe 40, 50 degrees or so, but we have a very modest nine degrees. And I think the reason for that is the PCM recognizes, obviously the engine's not starting, but the PCM recognizes that there is a problem with cam phasing. So our VVVL is very modest. Under normal conditions, I'd be worried about this, but because of what's going on with the cam position, I observe it, but I don't really think that is our issue. So let's dig a little deeper into the uh, bank one intake shaft position. So here I'm graphing, which is usually a better way to go. And I've set my vertical scales on the scan tool to the same value. So that's zero to a negative 25 for bank two and zero to a negative 25 for bank one. And I'm not graphing the RPM, but you can definitely tell the engine's cranking. So as you can see, as the engine cranks over, it starts right about here, that bank two has some normal wear and tear. Looks like uh, right at this moment in time, it's a negative four, whereas you can clearly see bank one is down, bumping into that 18 degree neighborhood. So somewhere between 17 and 18 degrees. So that's pretty significant. And clearly that's our area of focus. And I did this a number of times. Here I've got the scales flipped around. So bank one's on top, bank two's on the bottom. I'm letting it auto range at this time. But I did this a few times just to make sure that I, I'm clear on what the issue is with the engine. And this was very consistent. So I think I can, I can pretty much say at this point that the reason the engine is not starting is because the bank one intake shaft has is retarded about 17, 18 degrees, which might be about a tooth, but that needs to be proven. So let me prove that. So according to the scan tool, bank one is out about 18 degrees, negative 18 is retarded. So if you were to count teeth on the intake shaft, phaser sprocket, you would have 52 teeth. Now, this is the back side of the phaser sprocket. And just in case you're, you're not familiar with the way the engine is laid out, this engine has three timing chains. Now, there's one long primary chain from the crank to the intake phaser sprocket. So there's a direct connection between the crank and bank one and bank two uh, phaser sprockets. And then there are two short chains that are used to drive the exhaust cams. So this gear that you see here, the smaller diameter gear, that's used to drive the exhaust cam on that bank. The larger diameter gear, where I have the red circle, that's what's being driven by the timing chain. So if you were to count teeth, there's 52 teeth there. So you, if you were to take 720 degrees, the four stroke cycle, divided by the number of teeth on the cam sprocket, 52, that equals 13.85. So it's about 14 degrees. So if a chain jumps a tooth, we're gonna be out 14 degrees. Well, you take 14 degrees plus a few degrees of slop, that brings us pretty close to 18. So I'm thinking at this point in the diagnosis that most likely our problem is that the bank one uh, intake shaft is jumped one tooth in a retarded direction. And Nissan PCMs don't like that. And that's probably the reason for the no start. Now I'm gonna add a couple things here. So the entire time that I uh, looked at this vehicle, not once was there any type of cam phasing code set on the enhanced side. On the generic side, however, on the OBD side, there was this permanent P0340. Now I have no idea, you know, when this set. I don't know if this code set while the engine was running and then then it failed and it couldn't start, or it it was set while the engine was started. You know, I, I'm looking at this vehicle on a used car lot outside, so there's not a lot of background on the vehicle. But my point is that in enhanced, there's no data but generic had a clue. Now this is not a big deal because we have really good scan data and the scan data gave us really good direction. But sometimes you work on vehicles in which 
the scan data does not represent the actual position of the cams when you have a no start crank only condition. So you, you have a default value. It might be zero, it may not be zero, but you have a default value. And yet there may not be codes either. So sometimes it's a good idea to at least take a look if, if, we're, if we need additional assistance. Now, as I suspect you all know, when it comes to Nissan's, something we've learned over the years, that many times if a cam is out, we can disconnect the cam sensor and the engine will start. So I thought I would give it a shot. So it's fairly easy access to get to the cam sensor. So I disc, you know, with the ignition turned off, I disconnected it, turned the ignition on and I started it. And sure enough, it started and ran. Then I reconnected the cam sensor plug. So it hiccuped for a moment, but the engine continued to run. And I don't know how long it had been since it was running, but it was running kind of rough initially, but then it smoothed out. And the engine was running remarkably well in my mind, considering that the cam, I thought, is out about one tooth, about 18 degrees. So my curiosity got the better of me. And I thought I would just take a quick look at scan data. Now I will tell you that in my mind, I had already diagnosed the vehicle as the cam being out a tooth. But I was lucky that day because my curiosity got the better of me. So I wanted to look at the fuel trims because, you know, we've been taught that if there is a imbalance in airflow bank to bank on an engine, that many times trims can provide a clue. So sometimes one bank will have positive fuel trims and the other bank may have negative fuel trims. So I was kind of looking for that. So on Nissan Enhanced, instead of having words like long-term and short-term, as you know, we have alphas. And alphas are really the total correction. And the ideal alpha is 100. Numbers above 100, we're adding. Numbers below 100, we're subtracting. So the 96 would be a negative four. The 92 would be a negative eight. So right now at idle, and again, this engine is running reasonably well, you know, my alphas are reasonably close to each other and they're definitely on the same side of the 100. So I, I, this kind of caught me by surprise. So I elevate the RPM and you know, the alphas are, are tightening up. They're looking pretty good. And I realize this is digital and these numbers move around as an engine breathes, but they were representative of what I was seeing. I mean, the alphas really were amazingly good numbers. Here, I'm going to bring it up to about 2,500. So they're both, you know, a tad negative, but tight. Bank to bank, they're okay. Ah, then it dawns on me. I know why this is. I'm, I'm looking at this the wrong way. This engine has two mass airflows. So there's a mass airflow for bank one and bank two. So I thought to myself, well, that's why, because normally the imbalance in trim occurs if you have a single mass airflow trying to measure air mass for a, you know, a V engine. So now I'm going to have to bring the uh, mass airflow raw voltage pids into place. So I've added, you know, I've added the mass airflow pids here. These are the value raw voltage pids. And these are my alphas. And once again, kind of surprisingly, the mass airflow voltage pits are pretty close to each other. Now, I don't expect them to be perfect because again, engines breathe differently. And in my mind, there is a there is an imbalance, you know, bank one to bank two, but you can see, you know, the, the voltages are pretty close. Now, I'll be back to that in just a second. You know, we spent time obviously talking about VVEL and the engine now is in a default. You know, I, I tricked the PCM, I got the engine to start, reconnected the cam sensor, you'll notice it says zero. So, you know, the PCM, a uh, little, un little unhappy with me, but you no, know, the engine's running. But if you look at the VVL, we're at 27, you know, 28 degrees. So that suggests reasonably good lift and duration. And I, I can tell you, and I'll be able to prove this a little bit later on, this would be representative of normal air mass uh, through an engine. So that's kind of the default position but both banks are about the same. So I know that we have increased lift, increased duration from our, our, initial, uh, our initial crank. So back to this bank to bank uh, comparison, really surprised that those mass airflow sensor voltages are as tight as they are. But there you can see they're pretty close. 
<coughs> excuse me, 2,600 RPM. I mean, you know, they're, they're really close. You know, the alphas there, there's a little bit of spread, but uh, th those vo voltages are pretty darn close to each other. And I don't really know the condition of anything else on the engine other than what I'm sharing with you. And I don't know how long it's sat, et cetera. But uh, I mean, I'm, the numbers are impressive. And about 3000 RPM, so they hold tight. So I'm a little surprised by this. So I'm very lucky. My curiosity got the best of me and I took a look. But now I'm beginning to think that maybe I have not properly diagnosed this engine. Because normally I would expect an airflow difference bank to bank if cam timing were off. Now, normally I see that in trims, but since this engine has two mass airflows, I'd expect to see something in the mass airflow readings, but I don't. So I'm going to take a closer look at these cam sensors. It's not because I don't trust the scan data. I do trust the scan data, but there's something I'm missing and I'm not quite sure what it is yet. So just as a reminder, uh, bank one is on the uh, passenger side. That, that's the one with the problem. Bank two is on the uh, driver's side. So this vehicle was outside. So I have a little sunlight glare here, but you can see that I have a probe connected to the bank one cam sensor over here. And it's a little bit hard to see, but you can barely see my yellow probe tip on that blue wire for the cam sensor on um, bank two. Now, normally when I do correlations, I like to get on a crank sensor and a number one for, you know, for ignition reference and trigger. But my goal here was, I just wanted to do a quick comparison of the two cam sensors. And so once again, you know, when I shut the engine off, I disconnected the cam sensor to start the engine. I reconnected it. The engine shook for a moment, then it smoothed out. And this allows me to get my two cam signals, uh, bank two and uh, bank one here. And, and as I'm looking at this, I just wanna make sure I have an understanding of the reluctor that's creating these signals. So you'll notice that there are, as, as we go from left to right, there's a single pulse, a single, a double, a double, and then it repeats. So of course, this is a V6, six cylinder engine. And many times cam sensors might have six different types of pulses in the four stroke cycle. You know, one spin of the cam, two spins at a crank. So let's just take a closer look at this. So here is a single narrow pulse. And I know this is gonna sound weird, but this is a missing pulse. There's room for a pulse, but there's nothing there. So there's a single, there's a missing, there's a single, a double, a double, a missing, and then we repeat. So this is just a numeric count, not a cylinder count. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, repeat. So the shape of the reluctant signal for bank two and bank one are expected to be identical. They will be in a different position. They will be a different phase, but they are expect, you know, we expect them to be identical. So I want you to notice, uh, I don't, I'm not trying to do any kind of trickery here. I just want you to notice that here I had bank two red towards the top, bank one uh, blue towards the bottom. Bank one is the one with the issue. So here I've change my position only because in my mind, bank two is good. So I'm going to put that at the bottom, which is kind of how I think. And then bank one is the questionable one. I'm going to put that at the top. So that's the reason you see the, the position of them change. So what I'm about to say is well-documented. It's in Nissan Infinity service information. You can find known good uh, cam crank patterns on IATN, Diagnostic Network, Facebook groups, uh, there's, there's resources out there. If the cams were in the correct position relative to each other, the first narrow pulse would align with the first of the two narrow pulses. So bank two is my known good, bank one is my concern. So you'll notice I have two cursors right here. If the timing had been correct, this single reluctor would have been right here. This single reluctor should have been above this one right here. This should have fit into this window. 
this one here, the first in that group of two, should have fit in this window. So when we talk about signals being advanced or retarded relative to each other, the way that we do that is we say this, what is our known good? What is our reference? Now, many times that's a crank sensor, but not in this case. So my known good, my reference is the bank two intake cam. My signal of question is the bank one. So the bank one intake cam, the blue, has shifted to the right relative to my red known good bank two. So when something shifts to the right of where it's supposed to be, we say it retards. So I use what's called the double R rule. If something is to the right of where it's supposed to be, it's retarded. Obviously, if it was to the left, it would be you know, exactly advanced. So I want to get an accurate read of this. Now, without sounding like a commercial, I use a Pico scope, and Pico has a function that are that are called uh, phase rulers, uh, once upon a time rotation rulers, and they allow me to make some fairly accurate measurements. So I'm going to use bank two as my known good. So I put one edge of my blue highlight box right here, and then where it repeats, I put the other edge. So that's zero degrees. And that's 720. That's the four stroke cycle, two spins in a crank, one spin in the camp. And I'm going to measure how far away bank one is from where it's supposed to be. So this edge right here, where that cursor to your right is, that edge should be above this edge. So I put two cursors and I measure the difference. So one, my known good is at 361. My questionable is at 373, and the difference is about 12 degrees. So bank one has shifted. It's retarded about 12 degrees. Now, I know the scan data says about 17, 18. We'll fix that in a moment. It's never a bad idea when scoping to make measurements in multiple locations. Keep in mind, engines breathe. Crankshafts speed up. They slow down. We pull the slack out of a chain, we put the slack back into a chain. So engines breathe, so make a handful of measurements. So I'm gonna follow my own advice here. I'm gonna measure a few different spots in my recording. So here my error is about 15 and a half degrees. I'm gonna to round to 15. Here's another one. This is about 14 degrees. And finally, I got one about 13. So my window, I went from about a low of 12 to about a high of uh, 15. That was my window and my samples. So let's, let's just talk about what we know. Each tooth on the reluctor is good for about 14 degrees. According to the scan data, bank one is out about 17, 18 degrees. Now bank two is out about four to five degrees. So according to what we just did, my bank one is retarded relative to bank two by about 12 to 15 degrees. So you might be wondering if it's 12 to 15, why not 18? Why doesn't it agree with the, uh, the scan tool? And that's a good, legitimate question. And that's because my reference is the bank two cam sensor, not the crankshaft. So of course the crankshaft is the reference for the PCM. So the fact that the bank one cam, which I'm using as my, excuse me, the bank two cam, which I'm using as my known good in my simple analysis, is already out relative to the crank. I would have to add about the four to five that the uh, my known good bank two cam is out to the 12 to 15 that my bank one is out relative to my bank two. So if I add four to the 15, that's 19. I add five to the 12, that's 17. That brings me back to 18 degrees. So the bottom line is that my scoping of the cam data just confirms what the scan tool told me. So it was a good exercise, but I'm kind of back at the same, same spot I was. This engine is running pretty good the alphas, the master of flight values are pretty good for an engine that theoretically is, is a tooth out. So I'm still not quite convinced. So there's one last thing I'm gonna do and that's go in sonar. So once again, just as a reminder, bank one is passenger side, bank two is driver's side. And I'm gonna start with the driver's side. 
So you'll notice uh, I'm on the driver's side and this is the mass airflow sensor for uh, bank two. There's the throttle body. And I'm going to use a, a Pico WPS transducer and I'm gonna go right in cylinder. <coughs> Excuse me. And my goal now is to see if I can get a good read on exactly where that intake shaft is. Now keep in mind, I'm going to get what I call a conventional uh, pattern, but this is not a conventional valve train because of VVEL. So we are, we are in cylinder two. And I start the vehicle up. You know, I crank the engine, it starts and it runs. I have, you know, I had the sensor disconnected and I'm going to reconnect. But anyway, you know, I hit about 225 PSI, then it quickly stabilizes. So I'm going to horizontally uh, zoom in, let the engine stabilize. Obviously it's running on five cylinders now because of my transducer in the cylinder, but you know, it's running pretty good, all things considered. So just to point out a couple of things, Pico does have the ability to convert the raw voltage output of the transducer into PSI, units of measurement. I typically don't do that only because I guess I'm old school. I've used the tool for quite a while and I'm very familiar with you know the scales of the tool. And I know that one, the way I've set it up, that one volt equals 100 PSI, two volts would be 200.4, would be 40. So I'm kind of familiar with that, but everything is marked. So right now I'm letting the engine idle. It's letting this stabilize, let the RPM stabilize. Notice I have a clearly defined zero. And I run a cursor on the very top of my running compression peaks. Again, this is running, not cranking. And I get 786.8 millivolts, which if I round, that's about 79 PSI. So that's my running compression. It's a reasonable value. And I will do a comparison in a few minutes. But for right now, that's what I get. So I'm going to uh, go a little faster on my time. And I want to take a look at one four-stroke event. So I, I, I changed my time setting. I'm at uh, 50 milliseconds uh, per division here. And I take out my, uh, my phase rulers. And this is a reasonably accurate top dead center. It's not perfect, but it's close. So I put a mark there. That's my zero. That's my other reasonably accurate GDC repeating. I marked that as 720. I tell my tool that I would like you to divide this 720 degrees up into four divisions, of course, the four strokes. And you can see now there's shades of blue, kind of a darker, lighter blue, but there's zero, uh, 180, 360, 540, and 720. And there's other tools in the marketplace, such as Bertie Thompson's automotive test solution scopes, which are high quality. Uh, the newer Autels, uh, the Ultra 919, they, had, they do something like this as well. So Pico is not the only tool to do this, but it's a handy feature to be able to do this. So my goal now is now that I've broken this up, I'm, I wanna make some measurements. And there's three measurements I'm kind of interested in doing. And that's trying to determine, you know, when the valves open and close and the impact of the valve opening. And believe me, there's a lot to, you know, viewing and understanding these patterns, which would be done, you know, in, in a different at a different time. But my goal is to kind of make a look at some measurements. So what I like to do personally is once I have my screen organized, I have my reasonably accurate TDCs marked, I like to vertically enhance the scale by a factor of 10. So when I do that, I'm gonna take what you see here, it's all marked, and I'm going to vertically enhance it. And the reason for that is so I get better detail down here at the bottom where I can look at the impacts of the valves opening and closing. So once again, I have, an, so this is, you know, about 80 PSI, 0.8 volts, and I zoom in, and obviously the top are clipped, but that's okay, because I made my marks correctly, and I zoom in, I, and I typically do a little filtering, because when you zoom in, you know, the, 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 the trace line becomes a little hash here, so I do some filtering, but allows me to get a very clean pattern, so the first event that I want to measure is when the exhaust valve opens, so for those of you that may not do this that often, here's my zero, this is atmospheric pressure. So the piston comes up on compression and the compression peaks at about 80 PSI. Now there is no combustion because there's no spark plug inside the cylinder. So the piston is being dragged down 
by the crankshaft on what normally would have been a power stroke, but we call it an expansion stroke. So the piston is being dragged down and we are very rapidly losing pressure. And typically we will go into a vacuum. So zero here represents atmospheric pressure. And here we are going into a vacuum. So the piston will continue to move down until it hits the 180 degree mark. But you notice that before we get there, we've lost the seal. There is a change in pressure. That represents when the exhaust valve opens or EVO. So many exhaust valves open, many, not all, but many exhaust valves open somewhere maybe between 60 and 30 degrees before bottom dead center. So this would be bottom dead center uh, right here at the 180 degree mark. Now, again, there's exceptions to this. And when you have engines that have aggressive cam phasing, you have to be, you know, you have to take that into account. So right now, you know, this engine doesn't have cam phasing on the exhaust cam. So this is kind of traditional on the exhaust cam. So I have about 52 degrees before bottom dead center. That's where I put my cursor to the best of my ability. It's measured here. So the next thing I'd like to measure is the point at which the deepest vacuum is first reached on the intake stroke. So here was the expansion stroke. That's when the exhaust valve opened. And then we move to exhaust. And you'll notice that we're pretty close to zero PSI as you'd expect with the exhaust valve open. And then we move to intake. And of course, when we go to intake, at some point the exhaust valve closes, intake valve opens, and the piston is moving down and we create a low pressure area inside the cylinder. And we call that vacuum. Well. The point where I put the cursor here is the deepest vacuum that's first reached. Now, this is not, let me repeat, this is not when the exhaust valve closed. This is not when the intake valve opened. That occurred to the left, but that can be very difficult to see. What I've observed over time is that this point that I'm measuring right now, that's 57 degrees after top dead center, is impacted by both of those events. So if there had been a problem with the exhaust timing or there had been a problem with the intake timing, that point would be impacted. So again, it's not exactly when the exhaust valve, let me, not, let me rephrase that. It is not when the exhaust valve closed and it's not when the intake valve opened, but it's impacted by that. So many engines, that's about 30 to 60 degrees after top dead center. So that's pretty close, that's reasonable. And finally, the last measurement is when the intake valve closed. So intake valves uh, generally close in about the first third, uh, first 60 degrees of the compression stroke. So you may not agree with my, my cursor exactly. You might say, John, you should move a little to the right or you, maybe you should move a little to the left. But whether you agree with me or not is, is not super critical. What, what, what is critical is that when you and I are doing this, we have a repeatable process. That at, my goal is to compare the left side to the right side. So I just wanna make sure however I do this known good, I do the other side the same way. So I like to draw a horizontal line through my intake stroke. And then right where I see a pressure change, I put the vertical line. So that's kind of how I do it. And it's about 37 degrees after bottom dead center. That's a reasonable note. Now keep in mind, this engine does have VVEL and we're around uh, you know, 28, 30 degrees. So now I'm gonna go over to the questionable bank, bank one. So you can see bank one has his own uh, mass airflow as you already knew. So in throttle body, it's a little bit of a tight fit, but I got it in there, took some things apart, put them back together, and I'm in there. So I'm going to repeat the process. I don't have to say as much. I already went through the conversation with you. So I fire it up. We bump into about 225 PSI initially, kind of what I saw on bank two. I'll let the engine stabilize, readjust my scope, get my scale set. So my running compression, once the engine stabilizes, about 76 PSI. We'll do the comparison here shortly. I'm going to uh, vertically zoom in, break out my phase rulers, make my marks and my reasonably accurate top dead centers, break, break up my four strokes, 180, 365, 40, looking good. Zoom in vertically by a factor of 10, personal preference, get a little bit more detail at the lower end, and I'm gonna make my measurements. So my first one is when the exhaust valve opens, that's when the change in pressure occurs. So that's right about there. 
So that's about 52 degrees before bottom dead center. And again, we'll compare in a moment. I know you're probably curious. I get to the point where the deepest vacuum is first reached. So that's about 57 degrees after top dead center, reasonable value. And finally, when the intake valve closed. Again, I try to use the same method. I draw a horizontal line at my level of vacuum for this particular VVL position. And I draw a line right where that starts to take off. So you can't build pressure until the intake valve closes. So right there is when that starts. And it's about 39 degrees. So we compare. So it's a lot of work to get to this, but it's, it's, worth, it's worth it. So comparing the running compression peak values to the exhaust valve openings to the point of which the deepest vacuum is first reached on the intake stroke to the intake valve closing. And I think you've come to your own conclusion. They're basically the same. I do not have a intake shaft that's in the wrong position on bank one relative to bank two. The shafts are in the same positions. The VVEL impacts are the same as far as the intake is concerned. So my bank one cam timing is good. So initially I was all over that. I, th I thought the intake shaft was retarded about 18 degrees. Well, that was wrong. The, the data suggests otherwise. What does it suggest? Well, the only other logical conclusion, which we do see, but it's not always mainstream and it's not always top of mind, is that the reluctor, which the cam sensor signal is based upon, which is what the PCM and sometimes us use to make a decision, it is moved in a retarded direction. So the reluctor has moved that 15 degrees or so, you know, 18 chain slot plus the movement, you know, has moved. So it's the reluctor issue. Well, I had read about this but it was not top of mind. And it wasn't until I got to you know, this point that I thought about, you know what? I think I know about this issue. Never experienced it before, first time for everything, but I think I read about it. Uh, I, you know, and I, then I did some research and there's a company called Jim Wolf Technology. You should always give credit where credit is due. And I'm familiar with this company because they, they're into the Nissan Infinity performance world. And I've been on their website before, you know, looking at components, you know, trying to learn about like the VHR engine as an example. And on the Jim Wolf website, they talk about this issue and they provide this excellent picture. And basically they're, they're showing us the, the VQ37 engine. <laughs> Notice the generic code data. But anyway, so you can see that you can see that the reluctor is part of the intake phaser sprocket. There is a, a, a single, a single, a double, a double. And if you look right here, this is the good one. If you just look at the gap between the reluctor notches and the fastener that holds the reluctor together, and you compare it to here. So you can clearly see the one on the right is shift. Uh, they estimated, you know, 10, 10 degrees on a cam. Uh, unfortunately, this, unfortunately, I never saw the parts. This is a used car lot. They sent the vehicle to a shop, you know, we, with the, the diagnosis that I provided that, you know, the phaser sprocket needed to be replaced because the reluctor moved. But, you know, on, on a hundred thousand mile engine, it's probably a good idea to do other things. So, but I never got the parts. So I, I never was able to take a look at the reluctor in person, but that's what the issue was. The reluctor had moved in a retarded uh, position. So it goes to show that sometimes, you know, when we're doing a diagnosis, we, it's easy to move to a conclusion that says, you know what, it looks like in this case, looked like that cam, you know, that intake shaft was out, but with a little bit of luck, a little bit of curiosity, got right back on track. So I want to thank you very much for viewing this case study. Hopefully this information can benefit you in your diagnostics. Thank you.